told me so That's why when it gets ugly He hugs me cause he knows me, yo You gotta let go and let God Sometimes from the get-go you go hard It's like the darker it gets The brighter my light will shine So regardless I'm loving this life of mine And with the Lord by my side It don't matter what the call look like Just let me in cause I'm going for the ride Big fly, ain't got the shit to believe it I just know you gave me the word that I really needed So I pray for my enemies I pray for my family, my friends, my loved ones and those What's your mind?
Good morning. My name is James Dover, and I want you to want to welcome you to the Bethel United Methodist Church service. Let us pray. Lord, today we come to you with humble hearts. We thank you that, all, that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay, to lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and praise you with every fiber of our being. Lord, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess to you as Lord from generations past and present. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll be reading our scriptures from Jeremiah 17, chapter 17, verses 5 through 8, and then Acts, second chapter, verses 43 through 44, and verse 47. And it says this, Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. <clears throat> but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves are, are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now I'll be reading from Acts Chapter 2, verses 43 through 44 and verse 47. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. And we ought to continue into this phenomenal spirit of worship and rejoice and be glad in it. It's so good to be with each and every one of you today. Will you join me now for a quick word of prayer? Gracious and eternal God, we are so thankful for you, for who you are, who you have been, and who you continue to be in our lives. I ask that as we enter into this proclamation moment that you would decrease me completely so that you and you alone, O oh God, may rise up completely within me, that hearts and minds may be transformed for your glory and your glory alone. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, who is indeed the Christ and the people of God said, amen and amen. We are in currently one of my favorite seasons of the year. And no, I am not talking about winter, spring, summer, or fall. Or if you want to ask my favorite season with that, it would definitely be summertime. But we are in one of my favorite seasons of the year, and that is the NBA playoffs. Now, for those of you that don't know, I am a huge basketball fan. I have played basketball from the age of three years old. I used to always remember as a kid trying to get my brother Jacob to come outside and play basketball with me. And nine times out of 10, he would not do so. But I would spend day upon day, week upon week, month upon month, year upon year, back in those days, going outside till the street light came on, going and playing with my friends. I am a huge basketball fiend. And this week we have seen a lot of interesting feats that have happened. We have seen Dame Dollar, Damian Lillard put up a 50 piece on the Denver Nuggets in a losing effort in a double overtime game that had all of social media buzzing. We saw Kawhi Leonard just last night at the time of this recording put up 45 on my Dallas Mavericks escaping elimination and now we got to go back to Staples Center and hopefully clear it off. The NBA playoffs is always a time for heightened awareness. It's always a time for excitement but one thing that we have seen during the playoffs this year is something that we have never seen over the course of the last 18 years. We saw LeBron James, one of the best, if some would regard him as the best basketball player of all time, for the first time in his 18 year career, bounce from the playoffs in the first round. It was a sight that sent shocks through the entirety of the sports world. And why exactly did he get bounced from the first round? Well, some would argue it's because the second best player on the team went down with injury and was not able to play throughout the rest of the series. Some would argue that it was because of the lack of evolution of coaching and scheme. Some would argue it was the construction of the roster that was done in pieces not being there, but all of it would boil down to simply this. The Los Angeles Lakers, whom LeBron James plays for, did not this year have a good team or management culture. LeBron James was a victim of being in a situation where there was a bad culture. And this isn't the first time LeBron has experienced this. He spent his first seven or eight years for the Cleveland Cavaliers where he could never seem to get over the hump. And so then he leaves and goes and teams up with his friends in Miami. And when that starts going downhill, he then goes to LA. LeBron is somebody who is one of the most physically gifted and talented ability basketball players we have ever seen. But what he teaches us is that there are some things that your mere talent, there are some things that your mere ability will not be able to overcome because one individual cannot change a bad culture. And a lot of us right now can sit here and think that we have ourselves experienced a bad culture. Some of us have experienced a bad culture when we're in school and we can all think of that one teacher we had growing up that made it really hard for us to learn. We can think about it for those of us that played athletics. Athletics and that one coach that rode us too hard, that one coach who didn't believe in us, that one teammate who always talked about us. Sometimes we have bad cultures on our jobs with our bosses and with our co-workers. We can even experience a bad culture with our friends that we choose to surround ourselves with. And let's I say it, some of us even have bad cultures within our families, between all the family drama and squabble that we've been holding on to for 15, 20, and 30 years. We can all think of an experience experience that has had a bad culture and the impact that it has had on us. 
as talented and as gifted as we may be, because I'm here to tell you, my friends, all of us are talented. All of us are gifted. All of us are touched by God for a particular purpose. But as talented and as gifted as we may be, unless whatever situation we find ourselves in has a collective change of hearts, a bad culture cannot be overcome. And it's in this mindset and in this season of a bad culture that we find the prophet Jeremiah talking to a group of individuals. But see, the bad culture he's speaking of has nothing to do with the school. It has nothing to do with sports. It has nothing to do with work. The bad culture that Jeremiah is talking about and speaking to right now is the church. Jeremiah is talking to a body of people who make up a church that have a bad and a toxic culture. And why exactly is he talking to them, you may ask? Well, because these are people and individuals that may not be different from your church or my church. They are individuals who have gotten caught up in cliques within their church. They are individuals who have been caught up on traditions and norms. They are ones who want to fight over how they want to use the money. They are ones who want to argue about what type of music we may be playing inside the service. They are ones that want to shun those who they disagree with, shun those who make them uncomfortable. They are a group of individuals who have done things inside of their hearts that have angered God. And a lot of us love to talk about a God who loves and a God who cares and a God who restores and a God who redeems. And God is all of those things. But God is also a jealous God. God can be an angry God. And when you do things that upset the heart of God, then God gets angry. And sometimes we need to remember that God gets angry because sometimes that will put things in perspective for us about who we are dealing with. Because when we see the poor not being cared for, God is angry. When we see society and people being thrown on the margins, God gets angry. When black and brown bodies are being gunned down in the street, God gets angry. And when the heart of God gets angry, there is a reckoning that comes for those who anger God. And Jeremiah is talking to these people right now. And when we get to verse five in the 17th chapter, Jeremiah simply goes on to say, cursed is the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. You see, the issue that's happening right now with the people there in Israel and sometimes the people that happen in our churches today is that we get so caught up in our own strength that we forget who and whose this is all about. Because, see, when the text talks about strength, what it's talking about is not just an ordinary strength. It's talking about a great strength. It's talking about that one thing that you can do almost better than anybody else in the world. It's talking about those who can play the piano or the drums or the organ just about better than anybody else. Those who can preach, those who can sing, those who can pray, those who have the financing and the resources, those who have great strength that is almost unmatched by anybody else. And sometimes we at the church try to lean on our strengths a little too much. We try to lean on our strengths and our traditions a little bit too much. We want to lean on our strengths and the norms that we have created. We want to lean on our pride. We want to lean on our money. We want to lean on the glory days or the heydays of what was instead of being able to look at what God is doing. And sometimes the issue is that when we have to come face to face with our strength, we have to recognize that when we see our strengths, we are seeing things that make us comfortable. But God calls us to a place of discomfort. God calls us to the place of the unknown and God does not reward us when we want to get to a place where all we want to do is rely on our strength because when we rely too heavily on our own strength, when we rely too heavily on our own strength as humanity, we begin to make flesh our very own strength. And sometimes flesh being our very own strength is thinking that we have the right to control what goes on in the body of Christ. We have the right to control what happens in the movement of the spirit in our churches. And when we begin to do these things, our hearts turn away from God. Jeremiah is talking to a church that is in the midst of a toxic church culture crisis, and they are making flesh their very own strength. 
Because flesh is when you forget the weakness of your very own strength in comparison to the ultimate strength that comes from an almighty God. But some of you might be wondering what this looks like in practicality. So let me put it to you like this. <clears throat> when those of you that are in the church or surrounding the church are living in anger, living in rage, living in envy, living in pride and living in unforgiveness, decide to get to other people who are also living in anger and envy and pride and unforgiveness and rage and you form a little clique together. So that way you all can do nothing but just spew the negativity that's going on within you instead of being productive. That is making flesh your strength or better yet. What about those individual in churches who think that their degrees, that think that their accolades, that think that their money, that think of that their titles and think that their positions allow them to be able to control what goes on in a church and they then get together and think that they have the monopoly on how to be able to run things. That is also making flesh your strength. And the problem is when we get into these cliques, when we get into these silos, we wind up getting to a place where we have turned the church of Jesus Christ into a country club for members only. And when that happens, we get to a place where God is not in the position to bless us, but rather God has said that mindset, that mentality and that action is cursed. And cursed is not necessarily a word that is talking about all doom and gloom for you. But cursed is a word that means that you have intentionally excluded God from your life. It means that you have decided to think that your strength and your power can overshadow what God might be trying to do in your life. And friends, I'm here to tell you anything that we do in life that overshadows God, anything we do in life that excludes God, anything we do in life that ignores God is automatically cursed, which means that it is doomed to fail from the beginning. Because see, when we as humanity begin to trust in our own strength a little too much, we are not going to be in the position to being blessed by God. And see, Jeremiah puts it very beautifully for the people. And he says that when you are a people whose heart have departed from God because your flesh is your strength, you become like a shrub that's out in the desert. Now, some of you may not know what a shrub is, but let, let, let me break it down for you. A shrub is a little tree that sits out in the desert and it's characterized by a few things. One, it is a tree that does not bear fruit. Some of us are living in churches right now that have not been bearing fruit. We have not been living in churches where the spirit has been able to move. We are living in churches where souls are not being saved, where we're not finding new people coming into the doors. And we're asking the question, why, oh, why, oh, why? The shrub does not bear fruit, but it also is one that has no permanent source of nourishment. In other words, it's one that relies on what was instead of being able to tap into what is. It relies on on the glory days of 15 and 20 years past and not relying on the new thing that God could be doing right now. It relies on the spirit of old instead of relying on the spirit right now. And because it bears no fruit and because of the fact that it has no permanent source of being able to nourish itself, it also has no companionship, which in other words means it's a church that literally is only doing things with each other. It's a church that's not active in the community. It's not as a church that's not active in social justice. It's a church that's only concerned about what's going on inside the four walls of the church instead of being concerned about what's happening in the masses. And when this happens, when we get into this place where the church culture can become so toxic in this way, we will become thirsty like this tree that Jeremiah is talking about. We will be longing for something that God will will not be able to bless us with in this moment. We will be thirsty. And the problem is when we are like this shrub, there is no water. There is no peace. There seems to be no hope. Love seems to not be able to abound. And we get in this place where we are stuck in a secluded loop of spiritual suffering. Jeremiah talks about this toxic church culture whose hearts have departed from the Lord. 
But the good news is, my brothers and my sisters, is that that's not the end of the text, nor is it the end of the story. Because, see, there is always beauty that comes from God in the form of redemption. There is beauty that comes from God in the form of a greater work that is in store for us. And what Jeremiah talks about is on the flip side of a toxic culture, there is what comes as being a Pentecostal Christ centered church culture. And see, in this church culture, it's one that is characterized by being blessed and not cursed. But why exactly is it blessed? Because see, it's blessed because this church understands what it means to truly live for God and to have the indwelling of the spirit. This is a church that knows how to lean on God. This is a church that knows how to depend on God. This is a church that knows how to submit to the will of God because see, this church is blessed because see, we are blessed when we understand that there are indeed levels to this. We are blessed when we understand that we have our own limitations. We are blessed when we learn to love our limitations because we know that we serve an all powerful, limitless God because we are blessed when we can do good. We can trust God with our problems. We are blessed when we can trust God with our pain. We are blessed when we can trust God with our burdens. We can bless. We are blessed when we trust God with our finances. We are blessed when we can trust God with our marital problems. We are blessed when we can trust God with our friendships. We are blessed when we can trust God with our jobs because we have to understand that a blessing that comes from God is not something that's always monetary but a blessing from God means peace that surpasses all understanding hope in a hopeless situation joy in the midst of sorrow and it's understanding that God's love is always transcendent through all situations because see when we can get to this place of being able to trust in God we become individuals and we become a church that is like a tree that is planted by the waters And this means that we are rooted. We are rooted in prayer. We are rooted in the word. We are rooted in discipleship. We are rooted in caring for our neighbors. We are rooted in loving our enemies. We are rooted in taking care of the creation that God has given to us. Because when we are like this tree, we understand that we are a church and we are people that are richly fertile. We are ones in which there is new life that is always able to spring up. When we are a church and we are a church culture that is truly led by the spirit of God, we will be able to see the evidences of fruit that is always happening in our life because when we are fertile, we are always productive. And not only are we productive, we are a church that is unafraid of the elements that may come. Notice in the text, it talks about that this tree is one that is not afraid by the changing of seasons or the heat or drought. What it's talking about is that in any situation that we find ourselves in, we always remember that we are blessed. We always remember that we are loved. We always remember that we are touched. And even when hard times come and hit our church, we are always united in love. We are united in prayer. We are united in justice, united in knowing that the same God that was there before is the same God that is here now. And if God brought me out before, God will bring me through this now. If God brought my church there 20 years ago, God can do an even greater thing right now. We understand that a blessing means that it doesn't matter what the situation we find ourselves in in the current moment. The same God from before is the same God right now and will continue to be the same God going into the future. The tree is not afraid of the elements because the tree knows in all things I am fruitful. In all things I am prosperous. In all things I am blessed and not cursed. And even Even in the midst of fear and anxiety, I shall not waver. I shall not be moved. Problems will not be able to take me off of my path. In every season that a spirit led church finds itself in. The same God is able to move. And the same God is able to care. The same God is able to love. And the same God is able to remind us that even though it may look like we're down for the count, even though we may be down three with two seconds left on the clock, a church that is truly spirit led understands that we are never out of the game. Why? Because a church that is led by the spirit will never cease to produce fruit because circumstances 
are not an indicator of the favor that God has on your life individually, nor the favor that God has on the church universal. It doesn't matter that numbers are decreasing around churches across this country. It doesn't matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in. When we truly allow ourselves as the church to be led by the spirit, favor is always upon us. Blessing is always upon us. So as I get ready to close and I get ready to take my seat, there's one thing that the Lord wanted to me to remind you of today. It is simply this. If we're going to get to the place where we are like this tree and we are a spirit led church, we're going to simply need to get off the bench. You see, the, the beautiful thing about the text is that it talks about a tree that's planted by water. But when you look a little deeper into the text and you think about it from the perspective of the ancient Hebrew, the word is not simply planted, but the word is more is more defined as being transplanted, meaning that it was moved from one place to another. In other words, what it's saying is that all of us at some point in our life have a season where we are like that shrub. We have a season where we're like that shrub individually, and we have a season where we can be like that shrub collectively as a church. But the good news for us today is that if we are able to understand where we are, if we understand who we are and whose we are, and if we are willing to submit to the power of God and submit to the power of the spirit in our lives and in our church, we can be transplanted from a shrub that has no nourishment to a tree that is planted by the water. And see, the beauty about being a tree that's planted by the water is that you take your roots and connect it to the living water. And see, when we're connected to the living water, we will never thirst. When we are connected to the living water, we will not have as much doubt. When we are connected to the living water, he soothes all doubts and will calm all of our fears. When we are connected to the living water, we will be able to provide shade for those who are stuck out in the heat. We will have the river of life that will be coming out of us. We will be able to perform miracle signs and wonders. We will be able to galvanize our community. We will be able to build our churches back up. We will be able to show what it means to truly be a light of Christ in the world. So God is calling for us to get off the bench right now because there's too much of a world out here that God has for us to save. There's too much of a world that God has called for us to see. And if we can get off the bench, God can use us as individuals and God can use us as a church to be able to still do greater works than even Christ in the world today. So get off the bench today, my friends, and it's game time. Let's get in the game. Amen. Seasons change in our lives. We have our ups and we have our downs. But the one thing we know that because of Christ, we can be blessed in season and out of season. And if there's one who does not know this Christ, I invite you now not into a relationship with myself or this great church, but I invite you into an exploratory friendship with this Christ. You'll find the information on your screen in front of you. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are, I invite you to come because God loves you. So do I, and there's nothing you can do about it. Will there be one? Oh,
It has truly been an amazing day. Thank you so much to everyone who participated in our worship experience, to Brother Dover for that dynamic scripture and prayer, to our praise team, but most importantly, to you, our friends, our followers, but most importantly, our family. Worship would not be the same without you each and every week. Receive now the benediction. To the God who calls us, to the God who equips us, to the God who skills us, and to the God who calls us to get into the game. Give us the strength to be able to go and to be bold and to do that which you have called for us to do. And be with us as we leave this place, but never from your sight. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah.